From the New England News Collaborative and America Amplify, this is a special on racism in New England. Racism is trauma, but it's hard to talk about the impact of racism on mental health. If we don't feel like we can talk to somebody, we tend to keep it in ourselves and it gets internalized. We have created a society where vulnerability is a weakness. So is it unique for Indigenous people not to want to disclose a vulnerability? No, because we've done that as a society to all of us. And we talk about the policy interventions that could improve mental health. We want to focus on things like uh, more livable wages, because when we had these large periods of public investment, that's really when we saw the biggest improvements in terms of the racial gap. This is a New England News Collaborative special with America Amplified. I'm Morgan Springer. Thanks for joining us on Next. Today we continue our special series focusing on racism in New England. The series is a production of the New England News Collaborative and America Amplified, and two guest hosts will guide us through. Jennifer Rooks is from Maine Public Radio. Tracy Griffith is a professor of media studies, journalism, and digital arts at St. Michael's College in Vermont. They'll take it from here. Thanks, Morgan. Tracy, we often talk about the social, political, and economic effects of racism. What we talk about less is the psychological toll it can take. Right. Especially right now with everything just piling up. We've got a pandemic to deal with and the stressors that come with that. Job losses, hybrid schooling, isolation. We've got the national election and the divisiveness that that's created in our country. We've got racial unrest with many people of color just fearful in their own homes, in a place where you're supposed to feel safe. Sometimes it just feels so overwhelming. Does it feel that way for you, Jen? Absolutely, it feels overwhelming. I think any one of these would feel overwhelming, and that they're all coming at the same time. One makes us, I think, just so raw, just so vulnerable. But then also in that state, aware of things that many of us, I think, especially people who are white, haven't seen before. It's like it's pulling up the blinds on something really, really ugly. Racism is trauma. Racism is stressful. (laughs) And it can be hard to acknowledge the mental health burden that racism entails, and then to talk about it. So I actually wanted to start out the show by bringing in my friend, Butu Matthews. He's a Vermont-based mental health counselor in private practice. Hi, Butu. Hi, Tracy. Thank you for having me. So how are you holding up? Things are kind of crazy right now. It, it, they are kind of crazy, you know, and uh, holding up is definitely a challenge. Um, I do want to uh, acknowledge that, you know, because of some memory of H1N1 and the Great Recession in 2008, those of us who were around, at least as adults, then have some functional memory of what things were like. And so... Unfortunately, because we have that experience, we are able to pull upon those memories to uh, cope with this time around a little bit better. But I know that, you know, obviously coronavirus is a much bigger issue than than H1N1 currently. So um, I'm I'm totally feeling the the much greater magnitude of this issue uh, today than uh, than H1N1 did in 2008. So you're a mental health expert, right? What do you make of this particular situation that we're in right now? I mean, all of these crises, right? We've got COVID, we've got racial reckoning happening around the country, the election. There's so much. You know, in terms of the integration of those, you know, and uh, you know that, you know, intersectional theory at least says that, you know, one part cannot be taken by itself. It affects everything else. There's no denying that we seem to be really at wit's end as a global society trying to deal with a pandemic, uh, political issues such as the election, and of course, the long-standing reckoning that we've had to come with uh, in terms of racism in the United States. But this is also an opportunity for us, given that we are all at a standstill, or at least we were since March because of COVID, we had an awesome opportunity to address systemic issues, both in access to mental health as well as racism. And we seem to have uh, unfortunately dropped the ball on those. Uh, 
And that I think saddens me more than anything else uh, because we could have absolutely started a, a recalibration of our systems towards greater equity in both racism as well as mental health access. And uh, we lost that chance, unfortunately, it seems like. Do you think there's a particular mental health strain as a person of color living in New England or northern New England? Uh, you know, uh, isolation is one of the chief indicators of one's mental health. The beautiful thing about northern New England is that we are surrounded by such natural beauty. But then uh, the closest metropolitan area that, you know, Burlingtonians um, are close to is really Montreal. So our isolation tends to be one of the greater aspects uh, that uh, seems to indicate whether we're going to have a good mental health system or not. And uh, I think that needs to be addressed um, as mental health professionals uh, and as academics and intellectuals. We need to be considering the fact that we, Northern New England, tend to be isolated from the rest of the country and also from Southern New England. And you as a person of color living in, in New England, how is that element affecting you? I have to say that as a, as a more recent uh, transplant to the New England area, I'm still catching up. But from the isolation that I've felt from both uh, the Indian community as well as my, uh, my chosen community of people with disabilities um, and the queer community that I grew up with in Chicago, it's been tough. And I'm doing the best I can in terms of maintaining those relationships. And I, I think that's, uh, in the age of the internet at least, that's a much more viable thing to do. Uh, I, I think, you know, 40 years ago, this would have been a much harder transition for someone like me. That said, Northern New England can do a much better job in terms of mental health access for people of color because of our isolation. We tend to experience it a lot more acutely than non-BIPOC folk. So it's hard on our mental health, all the things that are going on right now, and it can be hard to talk about, but it's also important, right? It's important. It's vitally important. It's especially important for those of us who suffer, who, who experience uh, isolation and distress more acutely than others. If we don't feel like we can talk to somebody, you know, we tend to keep it in in ourselves, and it gets internalized. The idea that we're alone get, becomes internalized in us, and we then resort to trying to find solutions within ourselves. And the lack of those solutions leads to really maladjusted behaviors, whether it's drug abuse, alcohol abuse, you know, uh, process behavior abuse like gambling and sex and overeating, etc. And then it manifests itself in financial difficulties and relationship difficulties and legal issues and entanglements with the criminal justice system. So these are all very linked issues and they're of a much higher order of importance for people of color than they are for, for people who are outside these communities. Butu, I really appreciate your time. Butu Matthews is a Vermont-based mental health counselor in private practice. Great catching up with you. Tracy, thank you so much for having me on. Today, we're going to hear from people in immigrant and Native American communities. And we're going to talk about ways advocates are trying to address the mental health impact of racism. But first... How did we get here? <laughs> I think the majority of it is because of the structural disparities and health care or health service inequalities in our system that have been existing for you know, centuries, really. That's Dr. Charles D.K. He's chief medical officer with the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and an associate professor of psychiatry at the Yale School of Medicine. He says that people of color have a harder time accessing health care and health insurance, something we'll talk about more later. But he says that when they do get mental health care, it's often not culturally appropriate. Psychiatric patients also are more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia or psychotic disorders as opposed to their Caucasian counterparts who are more likely to be diagnosed with mood disorders. Black people are also more likely to be diagnosed with personality disorders, uh, borderline intellectual functioning, all of which are problematic in our system, but all of which also speak to lack of cultural competence and understanding of the needs and the presentations of people of color in our system. 
Dr. D.K. has an example of something he's seen, a young black man admitted for a mental health concern who is wearing a do-rag. It might be seen differently by different people, depending on who sees you first. They might think this might be a sign that you're a member of a gang or that there's something wrong with you, whereas it's just your way of expressing yourself. I, I have definitely seen many of our psychiatric patients being diagnosed with psychotic disorder for whom, when after, after careful examination, actually have uh, a mood disorder. I've seen people be um, offered injections when they should be offered oral medications. I've seen people not be offered psychotherapy when, in fact, they need psychotherapy because it's just not what people think about right away. So in my own practice, I've seen all of this. I've seen black people be excluded from research studies, not because sometimes people are actually looking to exclude them, but people are not looking to include them. So then it becomes a, a, a problem where the research studies are coming up with findings that actually may not apply to people of color because they were not included in the first place. And this kind of structural inequality, the kind that deprives people of color from getting the care they need, is just one piece of the puzzle. There's also the direct impact of racism itself and how it changes the brain. Kea Ganguly is Assistant Director of Youth and Family Services in Bennington, Vermont. She reached out to us. Being a person of color in the United States, particularly for our black brothers and sisters, the systemic racism and direct racial incidents that they face daily creates trauma. And trauma writes on the brain, it writes on the body, it creates you know, stronger startle responses, it affects your quality of life. If you can't leave your house because you're scared what's going to happen, or you have to be on alert, your mental health is definitely negatively impacted. Ganguly says she comes from a family of activists in India. Her grandparents marched with Gandhi. She tells us her family has experienced racism in Vermont, and it has left a mark. I have three adult daughters. They were all born in Vermont. They've all stayed in Vermont, which is we know is unusual, and they've chosen to work in the nonprofit sector because they want to give back to their community. Um, shortly after the elections in 2016, we started facing incidents where we'd be walking down the street, specifically my daughters, um, at, at different times, and people would lean out of cars and scream at them and say, go back to where you came from, you Arabic, and a swear word. Which put the, I mean, my daughter's been in fear. She was like, I, she started dressing differently. She started because if she, she can, as she said, I can pass because I'm light skinned if I do my makeup right. So it's completely negative. She's suspicious of people. She worries about what's going to happen if she's by herself. So it, it's a challenging situation on a personal level. It's a challenging situation on a systemic level when you have an entire group of people who fear, who fear the other when they go outside. That was Kea Ganguly of Bennington, Vermont. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, a woman who immigrated to Maine from Somalia talks about different cultural understandings of mental health and the stigma and fear of being ostracized if you seek help. We'll also talk to a Wabanaki public health expert about our collective responsibility to do better for Indigenous people. This is a New England News Collaborative special with America Amplified. I'm Tracy Griffith. And I'm Jennifer Rooks. Welcome back. This is a New England News Collaborative special with America Amplified. I'm Tracy Griffith. And I'm Jennifer Rooks. Today we're talking about the impacts of racism on mental health and well-being. And we want to bring Lisa Sakabasin into the conversation. She's Director of Programs at Wabanaki Public Health in Maine, has extensive experience in health policy and public health at the tribal, state, and federal levels, and is a Passamaquoddy tribal member. Lisa, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Lisa, I'll start with a big question. 
How does racism affect the mental health of tribal communities? Wow, that is a big question. Um, When I think about the impacts of racism on the health of Wabanaki communities, I I really think we need to go back generations. Um, We, all of us, should recognize the impacts our government and policies and laws have had on Indigenous people, the health of Indigenous people today. Our communities here in Maine and across the nation have been deliberately targeted. We're considered less than, we're made invisible. This has had generational impacts on our health that we see today. What I'm talking about is really multi-generational trauma, historical trauma, which is experienced by specific cultural, racial, and ethnic groups. And it's related to major events that oppressed a particular group of people. So we often think about the violent colonization of Indigenous people and what that has had for impacts on our mental health, on our physical health today. You know, growing up, my first year in, in college, you know, the, the year that's supposed to be one of the funnest years, right, of a young person's life. And I remember receiving a call, and that call was from a family member letting me know that my brother, my older brother, had just committed suicide. And I think about our struggles with my brother growing up with some of the inability to connect him with the resources that he needed to be well, to resolve some childhood trauma, to resolve substance use disorders, you know, that would help him reconnect with our culture, our Passamaquoddy culture, and all of those things that make us strong. There was a lack of resources to connect him, and it had a huge impact, you know, obviously on, on my father, on our family, and, and definitely um, also made an impact to motivate me on trying to create places to welcome Indigenous people to get well, to become well. Lisa, I understand there's some hesitance to talk about mental health challenges that affect Indigenous people because of the reluctance to reinforce negative stereotypes. Is that a problem? Well, I think when we think about the reluctance to talk about mental health, substance use disorders, any behavioral health um, challenges, that's a reluctance that exists in every community. This is a reluctance that exists in the white community the immigrant and refugee community, in many different sectors. We have created a society where vulnerability is a weakness rather than an opportunity for strength. We've Mm. created that collectively. So is it unique for Indigenous people not to want to disclose a vulnerability? No, because we've done that as a society to all of us. However, I think it's a much larger issue that we need to talk about when we practice bias, discrimination, racism, exclusion. We hurt everyone. We certainly just do not hurt certain populations. Now, I will say the burden oftentimes um, is uneven, you know, for people of color, for indigenous populations. However, this discrimination, racism, bias, this harms us all. What about when people do seek help? Are there mental health care professionals who are accessible? And do those providers have an understanding of Wabanaki culture and concerns? That's a really great question. I think one of the things I want to celebrate is that we have a number of mental health providers in the state who are Indigenous and who are serving our community members. We also have a number of Indigenous nurses and clinicians that are also providing care. So we do have capacity. However, we need more. I know you do a lot of traveling and are connected with tribal communities in other parts of the country. How does Maine and and New England 
compare with other regions in terms of how far we've come in providing the care that's needed? I would say the tribal health facilities that are located in each tribal community here in Maine are doing amazing work. The difficulty lies with capacity, which means we do rely on services that are not within the community, and many of our tribal people do not live right in the community, so they have to seek services elsewhere. So certainly it is a struggle when accessing services, particularly for something as sensitive as a behavioral health concern with somebody who doesn't understand the core of who you are as an Indigenous person, and if we are not providing that support to providers, to the system, then we are not going to meet the needs of Indigenous people. Lisa, tell us about the project you're working on right now. We are working to develop a Wabanaki wellness and recovery center, a place where Wabanaki people can go to reconnect to wellness, reconnect to their culture, and to begin their journey or restart their journey in recovery. What we know in Maine is that we've lost way too many of our Wabanaki people to substance use disorders, to suicide. And we need to be able to serve our people right here in the state. For far too long, our tribal chiefs have had to make the decision to send tribal members outside the state and sometimes outside the country to be able to receive care delivered by Indigenous people and that is culturally competent. And now we're creating that right here in Maine. And we are so excited. This was a dream from tribal chiefs over a decade ago. Before we go, what would you like to say to the rest of us? What can individuals do? That is such a good question. And I am so glad you asked that because oftentimes, you know, we're working within our communities. People of color are working hard in their communities and doing all they can to create systems like we're doing in the tribal communities in Maine to be able to deliver services to our own people. And oftentimes that lets other people off the hook to not really focus that we all have a role in this. So if we are going to solve the issue of racism and our behavioral health or mental health system, we have to have the allyship, the partnership with white people. It's time. It's time for the truth to be told, the truth about our ugly history in this country, the consequences of this history, especially those indigenous black and people of color. And further, to understand the benefits that this history has afforded white people. There needs to be a commitment from white people to do better, to understand better, to relearn what they've learned. We also have to examine our systems, our institutions, and ourselves as individuals. And finally, we really need white people to walk with people of color. We need to develop a collective vision for the future that's free of racism and its consequences to each of us. Because as I described, there are consequences to each of us. Lisa Sakabasin, a member of the Passamaquoddy tribe, one of the four federally recognized tribes in Maine. She has worked in numerous public health roles and helps lead Wabanaki public health. Thanks so much, Lisa. Thank you. Part of our goal today is to bring your voices onto the air. This is the voice of Amara Ifeji. She's a recent high school graduate from Bangor, Maine, and here she's describing her experience when she first moved to Maine from Maryland when she was nine. I was engaged in a game of Foursquare, and I didn't have that in Maryland, and I was really excited that I had won. And after my winning, this kid actually proceeded to call me um, the N-word and a monkey. And so those were just the experiences that I faced even just within my first month of arriving here. And then it has continued the past 10 years of just 
horrible, nasty things that I've heard from students, uh, youth, as well as adults. I was just feeling a lot of just self-hate because uh, I was I was black and I really was maybe like one of five black people usually at my school and I was feeling so much self-hate like I don't know why I look like this and why everybody else looks like that I just want to be just not unique I want to be like everyone else. That was Amara Ifeji from Bangor, Maine and here's Anthony Marquez an activist and filmmaker from Newport, Vermont. He says he was adopted when he was three and moved to Vermont from the south. Growing up in Vermont had its own hardships. Um, There was a lot of adversity that I had to face. Like I experienced racism in a different way, a different form. And unfortunately, a lot of that racism that I felt and experienced came from inside my own home. I oftentimes tell people that systemic racism isn't just within a courtroom. It isn't something that just happens when a police officer pulls you over or arrests you. You know what I mean? Like systemic racism consists in our everyday lives. It consists literally in our everyday lives. And I experienced it in so many different ways. Um, As a child, I never was able to connect with um, my mother. I was never able to connect with her. And through scenarios and situations that I've been through, it, 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 it was so... It was so tough to understand what was love. That was Anthony Marquez. Both Anthony and Amara were recorded for a New England News Collaborative video project that features young activists who are pushing for racial justice. You can check out that video at nenc.news. Now we turn to Maine's immigrant community and the particular approaches and challenges to mental health. Deka Dalak is originally from Somalia and has lived in Maine for 15 years. She has worked in a number of roles in the immigrant community, including in public health. She is currently with the Maine Department of Education and serves on the South Portland City Council. Deka, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Like you, many of the immigrants you help have come from African countries to Maine and have faced extensive challenges along the way. How can their experiences affect their mental health? So as you know, many of these folks coming from different areas in the world, uh, from civil wars, from war that is really still going if you count on Iraq and Afghanistan. So most of those folks coming to uh, the United States they carry in those traumas, and most of them are not really seeking any, I mean, health care or anything like that, because in their mind, they have to work and making sure that they're sending money back home and taking care of those loved ones that they left back home. And before they know, those trauma comes and, you know, in, in, in a way that it hurts them and they are becoming really uh, isolated in their own homes and cannot do what they wanted to do. So what we do as the community leaders and folks who are been working in the healthcare sector to um, educate for them and making sure that they do understand that they are important to us as much as they are important to their families back home. So their life matters and therefore they have to seek for help in order for them to help and uh, take care of their families back home and the families that they do have here. Some of them have uh, their families here as well. So they do um, bring a lot of trauma from back home. And and Deco, what struck me is you're talking about the trauma they're bringing from back home and then often the isolation they feel once they get here. What What a terrible combination. Yes, that, that's a huge combination because of the fact that when when you come here, most of us are not really experienced in the snow and the cold weather in Maine. And I'm talking about in Maine, generally, that's where we are right now. And also uh, coming to a state that is 97% white. So they're coming from a space that they have all people look like them. But now they're in a space that they have people who do not look like them. On top of that, 
uh, the experience in racism and uh, they are trying to navigate the system, whether it is the education system, the healthcare system. All the systems that we have here is totally different than what people are get used to having back home. So all of those things kind of becomes a big wall for them. And that makes uh, most of folks uh, isolated and not understanding. And also a huge other barrier is the language barrier. And if we talk about the culture, what is another thing? When you cannot find the foods that you get used to having, that is another barrier that you cannot really. So th- that causes a lot of isolation. And again, the community leaders that we have here have come in hand and reach out, especially for the elderly folks who uh, may not even uh, have ways to go out outside their uh, apartments that they live in and make sure that they are bringing them outside and having them um, talking to other folks who do speak their languages and have spaces that they can really stress what they feel and what their feelings are. Mm. I know that people from different cultural backgrounds view mental health symptoms and treatment differently. Can you explain some of these views and and why it might create obstacles to seeking help? Yeah. um, So when I first came to Maine, I uh, worked in a different organization. So one of them was the uh, City of Portland's Public Health Division uh, Minority Health Program. Uh, One of the things that I've seen is that um, a lot of people from other countries do believe you're either crazy, and I'm using this language really badly, you either, you know, on this side of the uh, mental health spectrum, or you are fine. There is no, in other words, gray areas, you know. In here, we have a lot of people who have anxiety, a lot of people who may have, you know, depression. But medication, and talking to our healthcare providers can help sometimes ease that uh, mental health issue that person might have. But we are talking about folks who never experienced that. So you have extreme mental health uh, people who have mental health issues that are in facilities that are really locked up because people are saying they are crazy. Therefore, they're not allowed to come out to the public. Now, and you're talking yeah. about what people are experiencing in the, in the places they're coming from, that either you're in an exactly. institution or you're okay. Yeah. And there's no exactly. in between. Yeah. Now you're having people coming in here and we are saying that you might have some mental health issues and it takes them back that there and said, oh, my goodness, are they going to put me in a mental health institutions? So they don't talk about it. So those is stigma is really on those folks. And they're thinking about that and they have that in their minds. So they kind of put that aside and don't really seek the health care needs that they have to have. And that causes even more problematic for them because of that stigma they have already in their mind. Decca, what about mental health providers, too? Do you find that there's a shortage of providers in the area who know how to address the particular traumas or stressors we've been talking about? Uh, for, so 10 years ago, yes, we did not have any social workers or uh, counselors who are people of color who can understand the culture. So we had few American social workers and counselors who really tried really very well to provide culturally appropriate trauma-informed practices for immigrant communities with the help of cultural brokers and interpreters that are coming from the same countries for these folks. But right now we have a great, great mental health agency, uh, Gateway Community Services. That are, uh, the founder is from uh, Somalia, and he has a lot of multicultural staff that provide his case management, counseling, home health and all of those things that uh, folks might need. And people do sometimes appreciate that because representation is matter. When you have someone who's speaking your same language and also is your case manager, it's really different than when you have somebody who is speaking English and then you have an interpreter on the side. So there's a lot of transaction if you will, happen it. But when you have one-on-one, somebody speaking to you in your own language, that makes a huge difference. And it puts a little ease on the client's perspective. The COVID-19 pandemic has been an added strain on many people's mental health. How in particular have you seen it affect the mental health of immigrant communities? 
Well, as, as you know, Maine was the highest affected for black and brown people when it comes to COVID infection in the nation, if you will. And of course, Deca, you're referring to the study that showed that Maine had a really wide racial disparity in terms of who is affected by COVID-19, in fact, the worst in the nation. Yes, yes. And many, many, many of those folks do work in essential jobs, but nobody was mentioning the work that they do. When you are talking about nurses and doctors who are really wonderful and taking care of us in our most needed times, we were not talking about the ones who were cleaning those rooms that we had uh, patients who were uh, COVID-19 patients. Or, um, for example, in Portland, we had the um, the Tyson food uh, place that had a lot of immigrants working there and get infected as well. But what we did not have was a uh, means to isolate ourselves because we don't have the money that to put ourselves in a hotel so that we do not affect our families. And when I'm saying this, I'm talking about in the immigrant community in general. And they were going back to their families and infecting their families as well. So we are, there are families, a number of families that I know uh, who uh, had the COVID. And luckily now, with the community of color leaders and the governor, now there is some money that is allocated for um, minority communities to be able to isolate themselves or educate us as an immigrant or black and brown communities to make sure that people do understand the effects of COVID and how to protect themselves. And if you have it, how to isolate yourself and not going back to your families. Deca Dalak is originally from Somalia. She helps other immigrants in Maine access the services they need. She works for the Maine Department of Education and serves on the South Portland City Council. Decca, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. After the break, how we can begin to tackle the impacts of racism on mental health. And yes, racial justice is a big part of it. But our guests will focus on one avenue for relief, economic programs. This is a New England News Collaborative special with America Amplified. I'm Tracy Griffin. And I'm Jennifer Rooks. Okay, we're back. This is a New England News Collaborative special with America Amplified. I'm Jennifer Rooks. And I'm Tracy Griffith. We've been talking about the impact of racism on mental health. In the final segment of our show, we look at ways to offer relief. Joining us now are two guests. Jamie Daniels is a licensed social worker and adjunct associate professor at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. Jamie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Tracy. And also joining us is Dean Robinson. He's an associate professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Dean, it's good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. So first of all, I'm wondering if you're comfortable sharing if this idea, the the disproportionate impact of racism on the mental health of people of color, resonates with both of you on a personal level and also on a professional level. Dean, let's start with you. Yes, it resonates with me on a personal level. Um, As a black male that spent uh, most of his life in the United States, I have been subject to racism for the the better part of my life. And even in my professional capacity, I have often felt uh, stigma and discrimination that's associated with my racial identity. So it's, it's definitely an experience that is pervasive, even if you have relatively high social status, uh, like me, a tenured professor. And, and what about you, Jamie? I see suffering that's the result of the subjective experience of marginalization in my patients. And I have, you know, personal experience with it. It's profoundly distressing to me as a black mother, for example, to observe 
the heinous murdering of Black mothers' children. I live in fear that my own children will be shot and killed by the police. And so this is both personal uh, for me and also you know, comes into play in terms of my professional work as a psychotherapist and researcher. You know, I'm broadly interested in the mental health of Black women. I see the ways in which and understand the ways in which racism gets under the skin and is making us all quite sick. So, Jamie, you mentioned that in your therapy practice, you work with women of color predominantly. What are some of the themes or challenges that you see that arise regularly with your clients? I am seeing the result of kind of individual, the experience of subjugation and so sadness and low mood, anxiety, um, agitation, hypervigilance. And now more than ever, I'm seeing a kind of internal psychic response to a lack of governance that... um, really guarantees the provision of basic needs. Um, And so really widespread, adverse, but probably adaptive responses to adversity. So existential anxiety, depression, symptoms of PTSD. You know, I'm seeing that uh, more and more, um, this kind of existential suffering. But so many of those issues are issues that you see across races. How is this attributed specifically to racism? I think that the experience of being marginalized or subjugated is an interpersonal experience and that people of color are incredibly vulnerable to those experiences. But broadly speaking, I think that we live in a society that has really relinquished its caretaking function. And so it's failing to provide basic provisions for everyone, like health care and adequate schooling and uh, safe water. So, of course, all of us are affected and people of color being among the most vulnerable, you know, um, with respect to the intersecting identity of um, race and class and gender and, and um, socioeconomic status. So since the impacts of racism on mental health are so rooted in structural and cultural racism, uh, Jamie, does it ever feel like the solutions you need to fully help your patients are outside of your control? You know, I think it's essential that we provide adequate services to people of color, mental health services. I think, you know, disproportionately, for example, African Americans are underserved. The rates of mental illness are relatively the same as their white counterparts, but their access to services is inadequate. By adequate services, I mean free and affordable access to mental health care by competent clinicians, clinicians of color who can really affirm their experiences and understand them on kind of, you know, a cellular level. I work with the assumption that racism is a trauma. It is a chronic trauma and that trauma really causes physical and emotional suffering. I'm a psychotherapist, and it would be silly of me to think otherwise, but emotional difficulties really can be eased by talking. And so that is part of what I do in my work. I talk with people and help to process trauma and mitigate the effects of trauma. But what I am seeing, and I think what we're seeing in terms of mental health and health outcomes, is really conditions that are indicative of social problems and not medical problems. And so in that sense, it really comes down to the kinds of policy interventions at the end of the day that Dean is fascinated by and talks about um, and researches. So Dean, let's bring you back into the conversation. Could you maybe talk about potential policy solutions to these health disparities? What, What solutions have risen to the top in your research? Yeah, well, you know, what I want to say is that we have 160 years of evidence that health outcomes, both physical and mental health outcomes, follow a gradient that's marked by socioeconomic status. So with each step up and down the socioeconomic ladder, health gets better and worse. For racial and other uh, minority groups at comparable socioeconomic points, uh, 
the outcomes tend to be worse. And again, this is true for uh, physical health outcomes as well as mental health outcomes. So to address the sources of disparities, we would really want to tackle both. We would, we would want to tackle the socioeconomic or class-based sources and the additional race and, and other uh, sources of uh, discrimination or oppression that affect different groups or di- different ascriptive uh, categories. Dean, I know that you're involved in a group called Men of Color Health Awareness, and it's based in Springfield, Massachusetts. What What is the thing that these men say are the ultimate stressors? Yeah, so it's interesting. These are low-income, mostly Black and Latino men. They have put together a curriculum through which they attempt to address stress, chronic stress, as it, it, it affects them in life. But I think that if you speak to the men you know who participate in this program they'll say that the stress that affects them most are those stresses that are tied to economic hardship so it's getting and holding on to a job that pays a decent wage it's housing security it's you know healthcare access and quality so these men are are quite aware that we live in a racist society but in terms of the agenda that rises to the to the top of their list it tends to go to things like higher minimum wages um you know workers rights on the job better housing access expunging criminal records that could affect employment opportunities and so forth dean maybe you could talk a little bit about do we have proof that broad economic programs work Uh, so a, a striking example was the establishment of medicare in 1965, which created a system of public health insurance that led to a a swift and dramatic desegregation of medicine in America. While it didn't eliminate racism in medicine, it was associated with a dramatic improvement in in black infant mortality. Uh, There have been a number of papers that have found that the civil rights era was associated with better health outcomes for black people, and especially black women. And The civil rights era and great society era were a period when the government was addressing both the economic sources of racial disadvantage as well as the particular disadvantage uh, due to to racism. And so we saw policies like Medicare, Medicaid, public employment, early childhood education, as well as the enforcement of anti-discrimination law. Uh, we know that from 1980 to the present, there's been a turn away from those types of policies in favor of lower taxes on top earners, deregulation and tepid support of corporate and business practices, a turn away from affirmative action. And this has had a deleterious effect on the health of black, other minority populations, as well as many whites uh, in the United States. The pandemic has highlighted these racial and ethnic disparities, which are really at base class disparities as they go to the types of jobs people work, the type of housing uh, that they have access to, the types of air that they breathe. So again, from my perspective, we want to focus both on racial oppression But we also want to focus on things like full employment, stronger unionization, uh, more livable wages, because when we had these large periods of public investment, that's really when we saw the biggest improvements in, in terms of the racial gap in both physical and mental health. That was Dean Robinson, an associate professor of political science at UMass Amherst and Jamie Daniels, a licensed social worker and adjunct associate professor at Smith College. And that's our show for today. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you learned something. This has been a New England News Collaborative special with America Amplified. This was the third in a series. Next week, join us as we explore how racism affects what we teach to our kids. We want to hear from you. What does your school teach about racism? What does it omit? What should change? Call our comment line at 860-275-7595. Again, 
860-275-7595 or email americaamplified at nepm.org. I'm Jennifer Rooks. And I'm Tracy Griffith. Our program was produced by Morgan Springer, Cindy Hahn, Lydia Brown, John Dankoski, and Jonathan Smith. Vanessa De La Torre is the executive editor of the New England News Collaborative. Theme music by Latrell James. America Amplified and the New England News Collaborative are made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. 